Blessings in Jesus, everyone. Welcome back to our study through the book of Acts. Today we are going to be studying through chapter 11. And we're going to learn about a charge that's actually brought up against the Apostle Peter in light of the events that just occurred in chapter 10. So if you missed that study, I encourage you to go back and read and study through chapter 10. Now before we begin, let's go ahead and bow our hearts before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you and thank you and praise you for this opportunity to read and study your word together. Lord, I pray that you would meet each one of us now in the power and presence of your spirit and that you would help us to understand the glory and the meaning of your word in context. Father, I pray that as we study your word together, that we are encouraged by your word, we are corrected by your word, and that we are nourished by your word, Father. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to chapter 11. Grab a pen, grab a highlighter, grab a notebook. The whole importance and intention of doing these studies is for you to learn what we are studying. Not just to hear me talk or not just to hear any Bible teacher talk about the verses. You need to get in them yourself. You need to study the scripture to, so, to show yourself approved unto God. All right, so let's begin with verse 1. Now remember, there's no chapter breaks or verses in the original manuscripts. So what we're seeing is a continuation from chapter 10. Remember in chapter 10, the Gentiles, that section of humanity, remember chapter 2 was the Jews entering the body of Christ with the Apostle Peter present. And chapter 8 was the Samaritans entering the body of Christ where Peter had to be caught or brought to and present. And then in chapter 10, we see the same thing with the Gentiles entering in the body of Christ where the Apostle Peter was sent to by the Holy Spirit and brought there for that purpose. Now we see in verse 1, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Now, the apostles here is obviously the other 11, because Peter went to be with Cornelius and his family. And the brethren here are the Jewish believers that are back there with the other apostles in Judea. Now, they heard that the Gentiles also received the word of God. Notice the emphasis is not that the Gentiles also received the gift of tongues and miracles and signs and wonders. The emphasis here is on the word of God. They received the word of God. In verse 2, And when Peter was come, come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. Okay, so now we're going to see this charge brought up against Peter. The news obviously spread pretty quickly if they are already aware of the Gentiles entering the body of Christ. Remember, until now, a Gentile who was a proselyte to Judaism, um, he had to proselyte to Judaism to be saved. But now we're seeing that uncircumcised Gentiles could be saved, separate from having to go through any sort of religious ordinance to become, a, uh, to become saved as under Judaism. So now we're seeing Peter coming up to Jerusalem. Now this up to Jerusalem is a Hebraic, a Jewish term. You always go up to Jerusalem. So when we see that in the scripture, we're, that's the way you understand that, because Jerusalem's up, so they go up to Jerusalem. And it says, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. Now contended here in the Greek is literally means to separate from, to separate from. And they're going to bring a charge against him, as we'll see in verse 3. This is the, uh, the circumcision party. It's an extremist group of Jewish believers that we're going to see more of in the book of Acts, and we'll even learn more of in the book of Galatians, or Paul's letter to the Galatians as well. They're an extremist group, and we learn about them some from Galatians 2.2 in, in Acts 15.5, where they have the council uh, at Jerusalem. Now he says in verse 3, saying thou, thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. So here's this division. Here's the charge. They believed that circumcision was necessary for Gentile salvation. Remember, there was a process. There was a, a, a thing that the Gentiles who proselyte to Judaism had to do. Now they don't. Now they are saved just as we are Peter speaking, he says that from chapter 10, verse 47, when he says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, 
which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. They've received the Holy Spirit just like the Jewish believers did from Acts 2. They become born again and are now part of the body of Christ. And so now we're seeing a division developing that these Jewish believers don't think that that should be allowed. They think that they should still have to go through circumcision and various other works as well. And so now we're seeing basically the seed, uh, the seeds of Acts 15, this, this issue that's going to be developing. Now, they're creating a division here. Uh, they're saying that Peter, they say, went into men uncircumcised and did his eat with them. Now, this did his eat with them. No scripture says that Peter ate unkosher. We don't know what he ate or if he ate unclean food or not. So we don't know what they're saying there. Uh, in other words, he didn't eat something unkosher or kosher. We don't know what he ate. But they're saying and they're implying that because he was there, he would have ate unclean food. But we'll address this a little bit more as we go. In verse 4, he says, But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, Now, Peter's going to give his account. He's going to explain here. He's going to give his defense, if you will, in these next few verses. Now, he's intended to give a complete report in chronological order. This is, uh, this is what comes out here in the Greek when he says, expounded it by order. So he wants to do it in order, in chronological order. The, the Greek word kathexis, I believe is how you pronounce it. But that's to show us just like how Luke would write in chronological order, while well, Peter's going to explain what happened in chronological order here. So let's look at it. He says in verse 5, I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descended, as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fasted mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts, of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. Now, there's a few things we can look at just in these few verses. He says, and it even came to me. This is new info. This is not something that we saw from the previous chapter when it happened. So that's something new that we see. He gets more specific that it came right to him. And now the four-footed beasts are the the kosher beast he's going to be talking about. Then the wild beasts are going to be the that which is non-kosher. And then the creeping things has to do with the, the mixture and the fowls being a mixture. Uh, there's The idea is that there's kosher with non-kosher animals there. In verse 7 he says, And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord. For nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven. What God hath cleansed, that not thou, that call not thou common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. Okay, so notice the verses 7 through 9 happens three times. That's what he's talking about. And... God is telling him, you're not to call that which is which is common is no longer un, uncommon, which is no longer common, right? What's what's unclean is no longer unclean. All things are clean in Christ. Because he says here in verse 11, And behold, immediately there were three men already come into the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. Now, this is interesting because this is a crucial point. This is not coincidence. Remember, with God, there's no such thing as coincidences. At the exact moment, these men were right there, already there. And he says, verse 12, And the Spirit bade me, go with them, nothing doubting, literally meaning uh, making no distinction. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. So notice the six brethren that we learn about is added from chapter 10 when he just took believers. Because Peter knew he would knew he would need witnesses because of this these accusations that this circumcision party, this extreme group of Jewish believers, would come against him on. So this is not just a vision, 
but he heard an audible command from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke to him. We saw that from uh, the previous chapter. So now we see in verse 13, and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. So remember, Peter is giving the account. He's giving his defense in chronological order here. So this is recapping and summary uh, the previous chapter. It says, verse 14, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? Again, notice the emphasis here is that Peter shall tell them words so that all the house shall be saved. He never says that Peter will show you some cool signs and wonders. He'll do some healings or miracles or do anything else, but he will give them words. Quite literally, he will give them the gospel. They will hear the word of God because faith comes through hearing and hearing the word of God. And the gospel is that which saves. Now, because we're going to see they heard and believed the gospel. In verse 15, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. This is that baptism of the Spirit. He's On them, he's talking about the Gentiles that were there. And when he says, as on us, he's talking about us as Jewish believers in context to his audience. So in verse 16, Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Okay, so now, until now, uh, they believe, remember, that Jesus died for their sins and was buried and rose again. There, there was no, no distinction. This is what they believed in. This is the gospel. So they had to believe that Jesus Christ came. He died for their sins. He was buried and he rose again. Otherwise, there's no salvation. That's what they had to believe in. And now we see... In verse 15, the concluding evidence being the baptism of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon them, just as he did on the Jews. This is the baptism of the Spirit. So often when we're talking about baptism, people get confused by uh, water baptism versus spirit baptism and so on and so forth. We talked about this a little bit in the previous chapters with chapter 2, chapter 8, chapter 10. And we also have a podcast if you want to listen to that specifically about Believing and Water Baptism. And you can find that with uh, our podcast, Bible Answers with Philippians 1-9 Ministries, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. And it's also on our website as well. And I'll drop a link in the description of this video so that you can access that quicker. It goes into a little bit more detail that we don't want to take up time to do right here today. But that's an important one for, for you to know. Now, now, in verse 17, he says... For as much as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So here we're seeing the gift given. So notice when we when we study the scripture, we want to go slow. We want to look at every word and we want to understand what's being said. So sometimes we'll go a little slower. Sometimes we'll go a little quicker. But here we're seeing this idea of the gift. So then as God gave them like the same gift as he did unto us, this gift is salvation. This gift is the Holy Spirit. Just as the Jews had their Pentecost from Acts 2. Here we're seeing the same thing occurred for the Gentiles who believed. Not who were baptized. The emphasis is on believing. And I only point it out because I want you to understand the distinction. Being water baptized is the first work of obedience for believers. It's believer's baptism, not unbeliever's baptism. We're saved by grace through faith. And we're told the first thing we to do is to be baptized, to show our uh, allegiance now to Christ, to show that we are dead to the world and are born again with new life into Christ. It's a symbolic a symbolic ritual that we do, something God has told us to do. 
but it is not a requirement to be saved. So check out that podcast if that troubles you or confuses you, because we go into a lot more detail on that specifically. But Peter says, with a rhetorical question, here he says, so who could I to withstand God? And then he says, in verse 18, when they heard these things, they held their peace. They held their peace and glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So, this is it. This is uh, whatever Peter said to them, convinced them. That's the verdict. Peter's, uh, Peter's critics, in other words, fell silent at this time. They glorified God, and now the gospel is free to go out to the Gentiles. And so that's an, in, an incredible uh, inception, if you will, of the church being now the Gentiles part of that. And that's why the book of Acts is so interesting, is because it's not like a prescription. It's not a prescriptive thing. The book of Acts, the reports and the accounts that Luke gives us are descriptions. They're descriptive of things that happened. And there's a lot of firsts and only firsts where these things happen at the beginning of the church. Okay, We're not seeing a continual door open to Gentiles. Once it's opened by the Apostle Peter there in Acts 10, it remains open. Same thing for the Samaritans in Acts 8 and the Jews, of course, in Acts 2. Now, a lot of that's repeat, but it's good to be reminded of what we're learning as well as we go through. Because we are still human. We do forget things. So it's good to go over things, to study, and, and remember these things. So now we're seeing it's okay for now. This is a, a temporary piece. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get more intense as we get closer to Acts 15. Because they're going to have a, a big council, a church council, if you will, in Jerusalem and so on and so forth. But we'll save that for then. Now let's continue. And... These last few verses, 19 through 30, we're going to see the, the witness of Barnabas and Saul at Antioch. And it's essentially going to pick up uh, where Acts 8, 4 left off. So just to kind of give you an idea. Remember, we brought Paul into the, to the discussion, and then we kind of went back to Peter for a little bit. And then now we're going to go back to Paul and see him as well. Now, verse 19, he says, Now... They, which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about, Stephen traveled as far as Phineas and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word, and none but unto the Jews only. So the ministry of the Jewish believers picks up now from, again, Acts 8.4. And remember, the believers were dispersed because of the persecution that had brought, that had broke out. Now, they were only doing this to the Jews only. They were only speaking to the Jews at this time. But again, now the Gentiles are here. This is the area that they disturbed. So now they're going to be able to preach to the Gentiles. He says, it continues in verse 20, And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians. These are the Hellenistic Jews preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, Antioch's the largest pagan city so far reached by, by the church and the believers. It's, uh, I believe it's the third largest city in the empire, roughly around 800,000 people or so at that point. And now we're going to see them preaching specifically to the, to the Gentiles as well. Remember, as far as the cities go, you had Rome, which would have been the largest city, Alexandria, and then Antioch here in this in this chapter because Antioch is going to play an important role as we go through as well and we can look and, and study some of the history of Antioch and kind of get that understanding it's it's important as we study the scripture you know as we grow in Christ to mature in the word of God we need to we need to avail ourselves of the historical and cultural settings of these specific places and understand what's going on what, what's happening in that time period? Why, why were things happening the way they were happening? We're going to see some of that start to become important as we go through the book of Acts and begin studying these things. Now, let's talk a little bit about Antioch. So we're just going to kind of get a little nerdy and a little bit historical for just a few minutes because it's important to kind of emphasize some of the importance of Antioch as well. And it's a shorter chapter, so we'll have some time to do that. So if you have your notes, 
we'll go ahead and, and take some notes on this. Now, we see that Antioch specifically, remember Rome declared Antioch as a free city. Uh, it was uh, its its own, it had its own municipal government with a population of pretty close to a million, roughly 800,000. Now, it was called Antioch the Great or Antioch the Beautiful, and it was known as the, the Queen of the East, if you will. It was a, a popular and beautiful city, and it was the center of paganism, and the patron goddess Taiki or Taichi or however you pronounce these silly goddesses and gods, but it was a pagan city, so that's going to become important as well to understand. Now, it became it's it's the reason that's important is because Antioch becomes the the mother church, if you will, of, the, of Gentile Christianity. It becomes like the central hub. So it's interesting how that happens, right? God takes a place that's devoted to demons and and devils and, and paganism and and idolatry, and He uses it as a central hub now for Christianity as the Church of Christ. So it becomes the center for evangelism and so on and so forth. Now, one of the other things about this place as well is that uh, it's noted that within about five, min five minutes from the city of Daphne, uh, which uh, known uh, for the worship gods Artemis, Apollos, and uh, Astarte, the worship of Astarte and corporate festivals and moral indulgences and all the other things that paganists, pagans would do. Uh, Pleasure-seeking temples, religious ritual, uh, prostitution, and so on and so forth. So these are pretty, pretty messed up places at that time. Now, as I said, it becomes the center. Antioch is going to become the center of Gentile Christianity, whereas Jerusalem was the center of, of Jewish uh, Christianity, if you will. Now, Let's continue a little bit more as we study and pick back up now in verse 21. But before we do that, I just want to point out again, as I have continued to do, but notice the emphasis that Luke is putting on preaching the word. Remember, in verse 19, preaching the word. In verse 20, it ends with preaching the Lord Jesus, literally the gospel. It's the preaching of God's word. It's the preaching of of the gospel that brings people to hearing the word of God and having faith and learning about Jesus. It's not signs and wonders and miracles. Yes, those things happen. Yes, God still does miracles. But the emphasis, the priority is always on God's word. And that's what Luke is trying to teach us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, God himself, to write to us, you and I, and that's what God is trying to teach us. So, Remember that as we continue to go through. Verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed, and turned unto the Lord. Now, what we're seeing right off the bat here is, is more people believing. Remember, they're preaching now to Gentiles, because Peter had opened the doors to the Gentile church to come into the body of Christ. So we're seeing that. Uh, they turn to the Lord. This is a, a, a Gentile term, you often used in, in a Gentile term that way. A great number believed. Why did they believe? Because of the preaching of the word and preaching of Jesus. Not because of healings, healing crusades, miracles, resurrections, and all these other things. But because of the preaching of the word. They believed and had faith because of hearing the word of God preached. Now, verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. They're sending now Barnabas to investigate the claims that are happening. Because the report, uh, a reported Jewish evangelist reaches Jerusalem. And now they're going to send Barnabas to investigate these reports. Now, Barnabas is a good model and representation of a Jewish believer. Remember from Acts 9, verses 26 through 30, he convinced the apostles of Saul's conversion. And later he'll fetch Paul from Tarsus as well. And he defends Gentile Christianity at the Jerusalem council that we'll see later in Acts 15. So, and we have talked about Barnabas in the past. He's the son of exhortation or son of encouragement is what he means. Now, let's continue a little bit. He says, who, when he came... Barnabas, verse 23, when he came and he 
and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. All right, so now he, he comes to Antioch, and what does he see? He's seen the grace of God. He's recognizing the work of God happening. He verifies the work of, of God, and he stays there to teach, and he encourages them. Remember, he's the son of encouragement, son of exhortation. Uh, that's, that's what his name means. Now, keep in mind, there's a strong temptation of uh, religious prostitution and pagan temples in this area as well. And so we're seeing the word of God and believers being added, the word of God being preached. And now Barnabas is there encouraging them. He's living up to his name, what his name means. Verse 24, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and faith and much people was added unto the Lord. All right, so let's look at this. Now we're going to, it's describing Barnabas's his personality, his character. The Greek here for good is agathos. It means good by nature. And uh, that he had, in other words, he had a benevolent disposition. He was just a good man. And he was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. So remember, when we see that full love, it means controlled by, controlled by. It's like wind entering into a sail and controlling its direction and giving it the energy to move forward. That's what happens when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We're controlled by the Spirit, but he's not only filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit, but also by faith. And now, because of his ministry of encouraging them and teaching them, there's much more people added unto the Lord. This is where he's partaking in ministry. Notice it doesn't say that Barnabas, again, did signs, wonders, and miracles, and all sorts of things. The emphasis, regardless of what else he did, the emphasis is on the teaching and encouraging and preaching the Word of God. And because of that, more people are added. Now, verse 25, he says, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Paul. He literally went looking for Paul. The Greek here uh, implies that this was difficult. This was not something that was just very easy. He didn't necessarily know where he was. He had to go looking for him specifically. The Greek word uh, is a difficult word to pronounce, but I'll do my best. It's that uh, anazetezai. But it means to hunt. It literally to search up and down, back and forth, and look for Paul. It's an intensive search, and it's, it's it's until he's found. Now, verse 26, he finds him. He says, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. This is Saul, who was going to be more formally known as Paul soon. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. All right, so he finds Paul, and he's going to co-minister with Barnabas now. Now, Paul's back after about 10 years, uh, and they spend a year teaching and discipling here. Now, notice the term Christians is brought up. He's given the, it's, it's first given to them by Antioch. Are, are in Antioch. It's given to them by Gentiles. Now, it, it was a derogatory term at first. Uh, it means in the Greek, somebody who's belonging to Christ, a, a, a partisan of Christ. And it's given to the believers by Gentiles. But it became it became something that, you know, we naturally now accept. And so we call ourselves Christians for that reason. In other words, in the Greek too, they were they were using the term. In other words, of uh, this is these how these believers were transacting business uh, when they used this uh, were called. That Greek word literally means to transact business. When he says they were called Christians, so they were uh, they were transacting business or they were doing works and things in Christ's name for Christ. They were they were ambassadors of Christ, if you will, uh, workers of the gospel. And so that's where that term comes from as far as understanding it. Now, let's pick up now in these last few verses. Verse 27, he says, And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit 
that there should be great dearth or a famine throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. All right, so now we have this idea of prophets, this prophesied famine that was happening, and so on and so forth. So let's break that down a little bit and, and talk about some of this. So now, verse 27, we're going to see this famine. So let's look at the famine first. Now, a prophet is somebody who had received direct revelation from God, and they had to authenticate it by predicting something to come to pass in their future or come to pass in their lifetime. And that is somebody like Agabus. Remember, the beginning of the church is unique because there's a foundation that has to be built. Christ is the cornerstone. And upon the cornerstone, we see a foundation being built. The foundation of the church is built upon the apostles and prophets. And then it's built upon from there. There's no more foundation being built. There's no more apostles and prophets in that way for the church as we grow. So, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So don't don't lose don't lose that track of thought. But let's look at this now on Agabus and let's see some historical context of this this prof this prediction of this famine that was coming and so forth and, uh, during the time of Claudius. Now Claudius was the emperor of Rome from AD 41 until AD 54. And this is a famine that was known to have occurred specifically in the year of AD 46. Uh, Josephus, one of the historians, that records that many famines which occurred in Judea between AD 44 and AD 49, and this is in uh, his book In Antiquities, he wrote about a, a, a proselyte queen, queen who greatly helped the Jewish people during the famine of AD 46, and you can find that in more of his book if you want to study some of the historical context of scripture and things and historians of that time, Josephus is one to get your hands on and just read it. But in other words, there was a serious famine in various parts of the Roman Empire. Now, let's look at this a little bit now. He says throughout all the world, this is uh, a, a unique Greek word, but it's essentially inhabited known world. We see the same term used in Luke 2 verse 1. This is the known world. This is the Roman Empire that they had at that point, which came to pass in those days. Now, notice it came to pass in his own lifetime. This is authenticating him as somebody who really heard from God, who's telling him this. Now, remember, when it comes to somebody who gives a prophecy, because a gift of prophecy is, is, is different from a office or a title or a position of a prophet that we see from the Old Testament just like an apostle. So it, uh, to test a prophecy, we have to look at the fruit. We have to see is, is what that person teaching, what they're saying, and what they're doing conforming to the written word of God. And always verify everything to that, to the written word of God specifically. And then, of course, in verse 29 through verse 30, we see this relief fund that's set up. Uh, it, the funds are not sent to the apostles. They're not sent to the apostles. They're sent to uh, to the church. See, he says, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, not being forced, not being uh, told they had to give anything else. It's not a forced thing. It's according to their ability. God loves a cheerful giver. To determine to send relief unto the brethren who dwell in Judea, which also they did and sent it to the elders, not the apostles, but the elders, by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And we'll see that as that plays out here soon. So this is a relief fund. It has to do uh, with the principle that we see in Romans 15 as well. But they're sent to the elders and not the apostles. That's showing that the church is beginning to go from this uh, always having the apostle as it started to now having fellowships, more fellowships, and elders being appointed and pastors and elders that are now the leaders of the churches that are around there locally from that point. Now, again, Romans 15, verse is 25 to 27 is that principle. When Gentiles received a Jewish spiritual benefits, 
they were obligated to share material blessings with the Jewish believers. You know, and that's something we need to we need to understand more as as Christians even today. We need to help. If we have things that can help people spiritually, then help them, our brothers and sisters in Christ. If you have things materially that can help them, especially those who are helping you with spiritual things, then help them. We, we have to be careful to get into this state of like, everything I have is mine and it's all mine and I can't share with anybody. Remember, if you're a believer trusting in Jesus Christ, everything you have is given to you by God. You are a steward and it is God's. It is not yours. It's not mine. We need to be good stewards. We need to seek the Lord on how to use the things that he gives us to bless the church and to glorify his name in all that we do. And that's what, what's happening here. They're sending up a relief fund and they're going to send money, food, whatever it is that they need in Judea to help the church. Because we're commanded to do good to all men, but especially unto those of the faith, especially unto the brethren. Now, we have a few minutes. Let's look at a few other little details here on this idea of prophets. We don't want to go too much into detail on that, but I do want to bring it up because we want to understand correctly prophets in Scripture and so on. Now, so we know that we know that Paul, Peter, and John received special revelation from God, and that's preserved in, in Scripture. Now, prophets' revelation is guided the growth of the early church. That's what it was for. It was to encourage and to warn the early church. Now, it's reflected in different activity of the prophets at critical, at critical points or junctures, if you will, in the book of Acts. And that's what we're seeing here at a time of a famine happening as well. Now, we'll see a little bit later, but these prophets are going to call out Barnabas and Paul in Acts 13, 1 through 3 as well. And then there's two other prophets, uh, Judas and Silas, that are going to travel with Paul and Barnabas, and so on and so forth. But the key here is it was for the upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. That was the point of the prophets. They were active at the church of Corinth. They contributed uh, prophecies during worship times, and so on and so forth. They, You can read more about that in 1 Corinthians 14. 31. I'm trying not to go too much into detail on topic of prophets because if you follow our ministry any time period, you know that we can talk about it all day if we want to. But I just want to make some necessary distinctions so that we can continue on into the next chapter. Now, we want to know, we want to notice as well that the, the different one of the differences is that Old Testament prophets had positions of government. They were in a position of, of government. And we don't see that happening in the New Testament church. We don't see them having a position of authority or government like the apostles had either. There's no evidence in the New Testament that prophets held any form of governing office in the early church, as some in today's New Apostolic Reformation, or abbreviated as NAR, would try to teach that the same exact types of apostles from the first century church and the same exact prophets from the Old Testament that speak unto the entire nations still exist. That doesn't exist. It's false. That's another Jesus, another gospel. So be careful with that. But while it's true that some of the prophets in the Old Testament had leadership roles, it, it goes way too far to claim that prophets held any form of governing, formal governing office at all. It just, it's not there. It doesn't exist. Now, we could talk about that some more entirely, and we should probably put another podcast out on that as well. But there's different kinds of leaders in the church. We have to remember in Ephesians chapter 2 and Ephesians 4, the separation of the, the foundation of the church was the prophets and the apostles. That's what they were important for. They had a foundational role, uh, but they were not necessarily equivalent in their office or authority or anything. And that's going to, that should, that should cover us. If you have questions on some of that, I encourage you, we have a lot of different teachings and apologetic tracks on our ministry page on Facebook, The Bible in Context. You can also see some of our teachings from our website, philippians19.org. So go check those out as well. 
you're not following us on Instagram yet, you can also follow us there, just the Bible in Context, on Instagram and see some other teachings and things that we put on Instagram that we don't necessarily put on Facebook either. So I encourage you to check that out as well. But that's going to summarize us on chapter 11. And we'll we'll see these things more. We'll talk about some of the different apostolic things that happened in the first century church. And we'll address some more of the prophets and prophecies that we see as we go through. But we don't want to get off on a tangent and begin to dialogue and discuss why there's no more apostles like Peter and John and Luke and Paul today. And we don't want to have to go off on a tangent, discuss why there's no incredible prophets like the Old Testament, Isaiah and Jeremiah today. It's just not there. But I digress. Let's go ahead and end there. And I'll see you in the next video as we talk about chapter 12.